Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, time for the science fiction book review because I want to get something positive under my belt before I get to some more, some slightly negative stuff next time. Slightly negative. Um, this time I'm taking a look at the, well, classic work of science fiction, Rendezvous with Rama. Yeah, the cover art is kind of psychedelic. It's the 70s. What can you say? Um, this work, well, it is a Nebula and Hugo Award winning science fiction novel, so it's got a lot to live up to. Well, let's get started. Rendezvous with Rama shares a lot with Clark's earlier, more commonly known book, 2001 A Space Odyssey. In the future, an asteroid tracking project, Space Guard, which, by the way, now actually exists, um, discovers a new asteroid entering the solar system and codenames it Rama, after the Hindu god of the same name. As they've run out of Greco-Roman gods and named stuff af after, so they're moving on to the Hindu pantheon. Further observation discovers that Rama is not in fact a natural asteroid, but instead was artificially created, which means it's proof that there is life outside the solar system. Thus, the Earth government, or rather the solar system government, sends a surveyor ship, the Endeavor, to investigate Rama and determine who built it, is there anyone on board, and if not, what happened to them, and what their purpose was. On the one hand, if real archaeology, learning about a civilization from their artifacts, is interesting to you, then you are in for an absolute treat. The entire book from here on is wonderfully crafted world building as the characters explore deeper, find something interesting, and try to determine why this was built, and what purpose it serves, and more about the Ramans for why they built this. And then in turn, if it's an obstacle, finding the way around it so they can make their way deeper into Rama and learn more stuff. However, if you find that boring and tedious, then there's absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, here for you. Near as I can tell, Clark basically went and said, you want characters? Sure, fine. Here's some quick descriptions, maybe a couple traits, but whatever, who cares about that? Big derelict alien spaceship! Frankly, I think this is Clark's weakness as a writer, at least for this time in his career. He's really good with big ideas. I mean, just look at some of the stuff in the novelization of 2001 A Space Odyssey. But he's not so good at making real characters to put in contact with these big ideas. For example, just look at 2001 A Space Odyssey and give me some character traits for Dave Bowman and Frank Poole. Not Dave as of 2010 or Dave as of any of the later books in the series. Just 2001. Or eight, and also not Frank as in 3001. Just in the first book, first movie, point out their traits. Any of them. Their favorite TV shows. Their favorite books. What type of music they like to listen to. Um who their family is back home in terms of, do they have a girlfriend? What's their girlfriend like? Why do they, where are they attracted to each other? Anything like that. You get nothing. I mean, yes, in the movie, we learn Frank is a family back home. And in the 2010 film, we get into Dave's wife, well, now, now ex-wife back home. But that's it. That's everything. There's very little to say about those characters. And, I mean, that, that's, that's the big weakness of this book, straight up. Yes, we do get some little fleshing out of the captain of the Endeavor, the ship sent for the titular rendezvous, um, in terms of, we get that he identifies heavily with Captain James Cook. We get that in the future, uh, well, polygamy is legal and he has two wives. We learn that, um, also, that he doesn't identify... Well, we, we don't learn anything about the rest of the crew, though. Well, I do find it somewhat odd that at the time the book was published, the Apollo 15 mission had been two years old, so presumably Clark would have known about this, and that the command module for that mission was named the Endeavor when he wrote this book, but he chose not to have um, the captain of the Endeavor identify with that Endeavor, as opposed to Cook. But still, nonetheless, 
By comparison, other science fiction writers who were very much Clark's contemporaries are very good about writing their characters who are interesting and fleshed out and interesting to follow. For example, the other great big dumb object book that came before this, um, as far as not written by Clark, was Ringworld by Larry Niven. And Niven's cast of characters in that book are extremely well fleshed out. They have interesting dialogue among themselves. Each of them have their own motivations. Each of them have their own little quirks and that sort of thing. Um, for example, we have a Pearson's puppeteer among the crew, and the thing is that Pearson's puppeteers who are sane, or presumed sane, usually aren't sent on these types of missions, and so there's lots of discussion among the humans about this alien and motivations, and each of them, through their own different character traits, have their own speculations around this character. And as we learn more about the rest of the humans on this voyage, nothing like that here, which is unfortunate. Uh, similarly, Isaac Asimov, who was often spoken of in the same breath as Clark in terms of his importance and significance to science fiction, has also wrote very, very well fleshed out characters throughout his Foundation series, and in particular, his sort of android mystery series, like the Caves of Steel, with the characters of R. Daniil Oliva and Elijah Bailey, both of whom are very well fleshed out, and in fact, Oliva and Bailey have about as much chemistry as Hercule Poirot and Captain Hastings, or Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. All that said, Rendezvous with Rama is a book that everyone should read at least once if you consider yourself at all a fan of science fiction. It's also, though, I do think a book that might work kind of better in a more visual medium. Maybe not necessarily film, but graphic novels. Um, certainly film would work, but graphic novels would also work as well, or animation, something. Something to really capture this amazing world that Arthur C. Clarke built in this story. Because that's where the focus of the narrative is, and I think, I mean, while putting it up to the reader's imagination is one of the strengths of literature as a medium, having the option there also, as well to let the audience sit back and let the visuals and let this gorgeous world wash over them also would be would be really cool, I think. And someone, if a good science fiction artist, a uh, good artist in general, were to do a graphic novel of this, I would absolutely love to read it. Unfortunately, the first person who comes to mind who would think would be perfect for this, Mobius, is sadly no longer with us. Fortunately, my number two pick, Dave Gibbons, is... Dave, are you watching this? Hello, Dave. Yes, make the graphic novel. Do it. Do it now. Now! So, um, but yeah, apparently there's also a movie of Rama in the works, directed by David Fincher, starring Morgan Freeman, which, again, I would love to watch that. I would pay good money to watch that. Somebody get this off the ground. David Fincher is an Academy Award winning director now. He should have the clout to get to say, I want to make this, and people will go, yes, David, we will make this for you. Not a common theme here of me wanting people named David to work on Arthur C. Clarke projects. Huh. Um, before I wrap this up, one other, one other little thing. A couple episodes back, when I was doing the E3 Unsold episode, I talked about um, fundraising efforts and projects you can do to help make the internet, particularly gaming websites and stuff, with the internet in general, a safer place for women. And for that matter, um, gays, racial minorities, give them a safe place where they can be online and talk about gaming and stuff without a bunch of obnoxious white teenagers just spouting slurs at them endlessly and, and basically being making assholes of themselves. Um, so another Kickstarter, in this case Indiegogo fundraiser, came to my attention around the time I did that last episode. It's only got a week left as of this recording, which is the 25th of July. But, you know, to help donate. They're actually technically already funded, but they've had to shift their 
purposes for the money a bit because their site got attacked by people who are against their message. The group is Gamers Against Bigotry. You can do a Google search for that. I'll also put the, na the links to their main webpage and their Indiegogo campaign in the show notes. Um, check these guys out. I would definitely recommend donating some money to their Indiegogo campaign. Um, they are, again, they're currently funded, but they've had to shift their goals to now wanting to make their site more secure so that they can better serve their purposes for doing what they set out to do. Um, presumably, once they've secured their webpage, we will probably get another fundraising campaign later to do the original purpose for all of this of actually uh, their, their more elaborate goals and efforts for get, making the website secure, certifications of web pages, and that sort of thing. But in the meantime, the link there's gonna be a link down here in the show notes with instructions on how to get to the Indiegogo fundraising page. There's eight days left, just over a week. So why are you not clicking the link? Yes, you may want to listen to me, but that's why you use the mouse wheel to open a new tab. Go. The video is almost over anyway. Just go. Um, next week is going to be a vlog. By the time you've watched it, the time you're watching this, I will likely have already seen The Dark Knight Rises. And next week, I will talk about it and tell you what I think about the movie. Until then, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.